was always funny how much the lack of situational awareness there was, and the, especially the young guys. They, they turn around and they see you, and, the, and your movements kind of like them. So they're like, he must be part of our, our group. And you're far enough away that if you don't look at them right in the eyes, they're like, I think that guy's part of our group. Mm -hmm. All right. You just get a little closer and a little closer. You do that with them, stick in the back of the group. Just drag one of them out of their chair in the back. It's kind of weird. What's going on back there? All right, how's that sound? Can you guys hear me okay on the speakers? Okay. <clears throat> Are they not on? Are they quiet? We can hear you though. Yeah. Here's, here's what you want. Yeah. We can hear you. Good. We're close enough and few enough. I think you can just yeah. speak. Yeah. All right, we'll leave it. Okay, not too loud. I always like to say, when I start this, I got here a little early. We get here usually on Wednesday evening uh, so that we can get the, the RV in place and everything so that Thursday morning the vet, rest of the vendors can start kind of setting up and we're not in the way trying to bring an RV in. And uh, so I got here a little early and uh, we, Rick and Jane were having somebody check on something before we pulled in and it's just Rick and Jane and we kind of looked around to make sure there wasn't anybody there so that I didn't get too embarrassed. And he goes, hey, Joel, I need to talk to you about something real quick. I'm like, all right, what's going on? He's like, yeah. Um, two years and you're doing your talks uh, got a couple people that asked if you could stop dropping so many f-bombs in your talk mm -hmm. it's supposed to be kind of a family friendly event like, oh yeah yeah doing too many years with the special operations guys and uh just get used to having that in your conversation so i'm going to try and keep the cuss words the baby cuss words and not drop any f-bombs while we're here but if one does slip out i apologize in advance and uh both, both talks so far, I got to the and I was able to throw something else in there so that it wasn't quite, uh, quite so offensive to people. I do say though, if you're offended by the F-bomb or you don't like cigars, then don't buy one of my dogs and come train with me because the whole time we train, I'm gonna be smoking cigars and dropping F-bombs. That's just how I talk. But, all right, so here we go. No crap. There I was. It's about midnight, it was dark. I was in a rest area sleeping in my little Toyota Tacoma doing one of my road trips across country. I used to do a lot of those. I had my female Mally with me. She was in the passenger seat of the truck and she was sleeping. I'd fallen asleep. Everything was quiet. I cracked my window so I had a little bit of airflow in my car. And I'm sound asleep. And when I go to sleep, I don't wake up until my alarm goes off. And our years in the army, it's like when it's time to sleep, you can just close your eyes and pass out. So I'm sound asleep. I'm laying there. All of a sudden, eyes open up. Almost never happens to me. I glance over, my female Mally sitting in my floorboard, which normally she's all curled up in a little ball, sitting there, full on, hyper focused on something out my passenger side window. So I start listening to what's going on. Come on, man, do it. No, man, it's a dog. No, you gotta do it, man. Just get over there and do it. I'm like, oh, yeah, that sounds kind of weird. I should probably pay attention to that. So I reach down in between the seat and the uh, console of my truck and I grab my Glock. I get up on an elbow and I sit up kind of as quick as I can because I don't want to be like looking all groggy too much. And I look up, and there's three kids wearing sweatpants and baggy hoodies. And they're all sitting there looking like, oh, man, you gotta get over there and do something. And I'm like, hey boys, is there a problem? And they're like, no, 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 we didn't have any issues. And they took off and I decided that rest area was no longer a safe place for me. So I'm definitely not going back to sleep and, we're, and pretending like nothing just happened. I got back in the driver's seat of my truck and I kept driving. And I've had numerous situations like that occur over the years where maybe nothing was gonna happen, maybe something was gonna happen, but because I had my dog, the dog created an initial deterrent and then I was able to be aware and alert of what was going on. I was able to keep whatever may have been going on from happening. I had a situation where we were driving with my family and I think at the time we had six kids. So we drove a 12 passenger van. My oldest daughter, uh, who pretty much raised most of our younger kids, you know, if you have a lot of kids, uh, about the time you get kid number four, kid number four takes care of the next baby and it just kind of trickles from there. And uh, the most exhausting number of children to have is three, by the way. If you have three kids and you're exhausted, have a fourth kid and your first kid will start taking care of that kid and all of a sudden your workload just dwindles and dwindles and dwindles. And when we get in the car, 
I'd be like, all right, kids, load up. Big kids, buckle your little brothers and sisters in. And all I had to do was get in the car and drive. And when I take all my little kids on a trip, I'd be like, this is exhausting. I had to buckle every one of them into their car seats and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, we're on one of our road trips. And, um, and what we would do on these trips is we'd try and, and do our gas stops fairly quickly because, you know, we we were often driving from Tampa to Fairbanks, Alaska. So this is like a five-day road trip with almost no stop, sleeping in the van, all that kind of stuff. And uh, so we were on one of these gas stops, and uh, I had gotten the fuel going, and my wife had taken some of the kids in. My oldest daughter had already come back out with a couple of the kids that had already used the bathroom. So I'm like, all right, you got this, sweetheart. You just keep an eye on these kids. I'm going to run and use the bathroom. Your mom should be out in a second. And then as soon as I get back, we'll jump in and we'll hit the road again. So she's out there kind of waiting outside the vehicle like a diligent daughter. She's not in just being uh, totally oblivious to what's going on. And there's this creeper dude over next to the door of the uh, gas station. And a lot of the gas stations you have to go through in these towns are like fairly remote. They're not like big city things. They're like, we're kind of out in, the, in an area where, you know, gas is like $2 a gallon more because it takes so long to drive the tanker out there and deliver it. And um, so this dude's just staring at her, staring at her. And I go inside, staring at her, and he, see, he decides, hmm, I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna walk over there to that van. And he see, she sees him start to move towards her, and she's like, okay, that makes me extremely uncomfortable. She opens the van door, grabs my Mally female, brings her out, puts her in a seat, and he's like, never mind, and veers off and goes and does whatever else he was gonna do. Now maybe he just thought he'd get a couple bucks because she was a naive little kid, who knows what he had in his mind, but the presence of the dog, bringing a dog out of the van, and just them seeing her was like, nope, I don't want to go interact with that. And these kinds of situations I hear from my clients quite frequently, actually. A couple times a year, I'll get some kind of email where something was going on, dog was in the vehicle with us, or we were at home, the presence of the dog just coming out, the situation immediately went neutral, and they decided they didn't want to have anything to do with what was going on. So for those who don't know, my name is Joel Riles. Uh, we have basically three prongs to our company. We have Fortress Canine, which is where we sell our trained protection dogs. We have Fortress Canine Puppies because all of the dogs that we train and sell are dogs that we breed. So when we do a litter, I select the dogs out that are going into the protection program, but we always have some extra pups in the litters, and then those puppies are available for sale. And then we also have Canine Academy, which is, I really developed it because we were selling puppies and I wanted to make sure, hey, people are buying Malinois and Dutch Shepherd puppies. I don't want my dogs ending up in shelters. I want to make sure that they have a way to train their dogs so that they're functional in their families and they're not just crazy Malinois, right? And so we developed Canine Academy. Uh, it's an online training uh, program primarily, but then we also do some local training in Orlando and stuff like that that runs underneath that. And if you guys are here, you're probably here for one of three reasons. Number one, you just think dogs are really cool. And you want to see that demo at the end where we're going to deploy them and do a little bit of bite work. And that's awesome. If you're here, welcome. The other one is, you know you want a dog, but you're not quite sure how to go about getting a protection dog. You're like, I don't know how much they cost. If they're like really expensive, is there an option for me? And we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about some of the different options about how to go about getting a dog that's a protection dog for your family. Um, there's various different price levels, and it really depends on, do you have more time or do you have more money? And those two things make the decision as to, are you going to invest a smaller amount of money and then put your time into it? Or do you not have the time to put into it? You need to pay somebody else to do the work for you, and then you get the finished product at the end. And, uh, and then the other one is, hey, I'm not even sure I need a dog at all, right? I've got my gun. I've put other kind of things in, in place in my home or on my property. And I think I got my security pretty squared down. But what's this whole dog thing? Do I even need to add one of these things into my security? And we're going to be talking about that as well. I'm going to try and make everybody happy today. So when I got my very first protection dog, it was back in 2003. Didn't know anything about dogs. And I was a lowly lieutenant in the U.S. Army. And I had just gotten back from a deployment, and my then wife, now ex-wife, much better off without her around in my life. No offense to all the ladies here. Uh, just be a good wife. And um, that's probably offensive too. But uh, that's what okay because I don't have any problem offending people. So, but the one thing I did not have was a lot of money, right? Because even though lieutenants make a little bit more than a private, of course, uh, you don't make a lot. And I certainly couldn't afford a twenty, thirty thousand dollar dog. So what I did was I bought a puppy. Now, the company that I went with, the only reason I went with that company, because I was dumb and didn't know anything about dogs, although it was a blessing that I ended up working with them, was because 
for fifteen hundred dollars I could get a puppy, and for fifteen hundred dollars I could get a week of training, and everywhere else it was three thousand dollars for a puppy. And so I was like, well, I can get a week of training for the same price if I go with this company. So we went with that company. I got my puppy. I brought it home. Came with a VHS tape, duct taped to the top of its crate. So I pulled that VHS tape out and I stuck it in the VHS player, which you guys might not even know what VHS tapes are. I don't know. They're the old like DVDs, right before everything was streaming. And uh, so I watched that thing and it said, here's how you do your basic obedience and your puppy. And I worked with my puppy for about five weeks before I went and did my week of training. And um, I got there, we did our week of training, it was awesome, and they really connected with me while we were there, and they said, you know what, if you want to do some of this high-speed training that we were doing over there, you need a Malinois. And they took me and said, pick a dog from this litter, and I was like, uh, I can't afford to buy another dog, and they're like, You're, we're giving it to you, pick one. So I went, okay, uh, that one. Again, I didn't know anything about dogs, so I got this little female Malinois, and she was only six weeks old and brought two dogs home. I was like, uh, hey, honey, I'm bringing two dogs home instead of the one that we already had. And she was like, uh, okay, I guess. She didn't realize that she had uh, had a husband that had gotten the bug for doing dogs and it became my obsession for the next 20 years. But that's how I got my first protection dog. Uh, I would go up, I would train with them, and it started off just obedience and agility and teaching my dog how to do basic stuff. You know, teach, training them how to live in the house with us, how to be in their place and not chew on the furniture and all that kind of stuff. And then we did the protection work and we just developed that dog as we went. And, uh, and then it just kind of compounded more dogs, you know, over the years and all that kind of stuff. So that is definitely one of the options that you can do is get a dog from a good breeder and then if it's a good breeder trainer, work with that guy and continue developing that dog till you get it to the level you want and you're comfortable with and feel like now I've got a, a dog I can rely on. The other one is a lot of our clients are uh, they're, they're business owners, they're sometimes truck drivers, they're people who are making a decent living, but they're working a lot to do it, right? And they don't have a lot of spare time, they don't have a lot of, uh, they, they have money, but they don't have that time to invest and to put into the dog. And so what we do for those is they pay me to do the work, I train the dog up for them, and then they come and we spend five days and we teach them how to handle their dog. And then we do four follow-ups with them, three to five days at a time over the next year. And then at the end of the year, they typically just do annual follow-ups, if anything. It's more like they feel as needed. They come in and they train with us as needed at that point. And that is definitely an option too. So if you've got the money, but you don't have the time to invest in it, we can do the work for you or somebody who does what we do. And we're going to talk about how to select um, you know, questions that you want to ask and things like that when you're, when you're calling around and talking to people about where you want to get your dog from. And then the other one, I've been getting a lot of questions about this, especially recently, because we recently started running Facebook ads. And probably about eight out of the 10 people that respond to my Facebook ads are, I've already got a dog. Will you take it and train it to be a protection dog? I'm like, well, we do not do board and train at our facility. But what we do is if you have a dog, you get a good solid obedience foundation in your dog. We do three to five day protection intensives. And I've actually met several people at these events specifically at Prepper Camp here over the last couple of years who come to us about every three months and they spend three to five days training with us and they have dogs that aren't our dogs, they had them before and they come in and we, the first time you come in those situations, I wanna make sure you actually have a good obedience foundation in your dog before we start teaching this thing to bite, right? <laughs> and uh, so sometimes that's a half a day, sometimes it's a day and a half and what we wanna make sure is that if you do need to correct your dog, it's not gonna try and turn on the handler. And so we want to make sure there's a good bond there and that you've got a pretty decent, solid obedience foundation. And it will help you continue to develop that as you go. And, uh, and so that's the third option is I've already got this dog, but I'm willing to, to come and invest a little bit of time with you uh, every couple months so that we can develop this dog into a protection dog. So there's definitely multiple options and multiple ways that you can get a protection dog in your life that costs various different amounts of money versus time as you're trying to balance all that out. So... The big question is, do I even need to add a dog into my security plan at all? Well, there are certain things that the dog brings to a security plan that there's no other way to get. And the first one of those that the dog brings is their senses. So my mentor used to say, the dog has access to a world that we do not have access to. Now, most of that world that we don't have access to is the world of scent, right? So they have uh, the capability of detecting things with scent that our most advanced machinery can't even come close to. So you can use this scent to your advantage for numerous different things. You can train a dog to track. 
if you have children and you have a large piece of property and you're worried about them wandering off into the woods and uh oh i need to go find little susie who was out there playing 30 minutes ago but where is she i spent 15 20 minutes looking around for her she's nowhere to be found you grab your dog that's been trained to track you got to the last place you know susie was at with one of her dirty socks and you got some solid scent show it to your dog you go track yay susie was you know 15 minutes into the woods looking for frogs or something like that and but now susie's found we don't have to worry about susie getting lost in the woods right that's one way we can use their scent the other way is they become very very uh, in tune with their environments so when we get here early on third on wednesday well wednesday night early thursday morning we wake up the dogs start looking around going okay totally new environment we just showed up at a new place by about 10 a.m. to noon, somewhere in there, they're like, got it, this is what's going on. Okay, and now I'm familiar with the scents that are here, I'm familiar with the sounds that I'm hearing, all of that kind of stuff. Well, at your home, they're gonna be even more hyper aware of what is normal here. And if they sent a coyote, they're gonna let you know. If they sent some other kind of predator in the woods, they're gonna let you know. If they sent a person who doesn't belong there, and they'll figure out what each type of scent is. The, the delivery people, they'll know, hey, these are delivery guys. And they're gonna bark at them, but when you start listening to the types of barks that you hear, you're gonna be like, aha, we got a delivery. That's their delivery man bark, or their mailman bark. Or you're gonna be like, that is a bark I need to go check on. Because there is somebody here who they do not know and they don't like, right? And a lot of that detection, some of it's with their sight, but a lot of it's with their sense of smell. And they're like, I don't know who that person is, I don't like them being in my area. Right now, a lot of dogs are what we call protective. And protective means I see something I don't like, I'm gonna bark at it, I'm gonna kind of show some aggression and posture. And that's that's a good thing, that's a deterrent. But there's a that the difference between protective and protection is that most dogs that will do that, if I were to put pressure on that dog and charge at that dog, they're gonna be like, sorry boss, I tried, I barked at him, uh-uh, I'm out of here, right? Because a human is a pinnacle predator, and the dogs know a human is a pinnacle predator. They'll do the same thing, they'll bark at a bear, but if a bear charges a dog, what do you want your dog to do? Nine times out of 10, you want your dog to run, because otherwise they're becoming bear food, right? And so, that's what will happen if a dog's not been trained to deal with the stress of a fight with a pinnacle predator such as a human. And so, if you're, it's kind of like having a gun that's not loaded. If you have a gun that's not loaded, you might be able to use that gun. Hey guys, can you keep the volume down for me? Thanks. You might be able to take that gun and point it at a bad guy, and he goes, okay, I don't want anything to do with this, I'm gonna leave. But if that bad guy goes, you're not gonna pull that trigger, and starts walking towards you, and all you have is click, you're in a world of hurt at that point. So that's something just to keep in mind. Deterrents are a good thing, but do you want an empty gun, or do you want a loaded gun? The other thing the dogs bring is their sense of hearing. And they don't hear a lot better than we do in terms of the volumes that they can hear, but what they do have is the frequencies that they can hear. And one of my favorite stories to tell on this is, um, when I was young and stupid, and I was getting into the dog world, uh, I was all, oh, oh, let's do all the crazy stuff. We were repelling with the dogs. We were getting into torpedo tubes and submarines because the guys I was working with had access to all this kind of stuff. And uh, we were climbing into these torpedo tubes with our dogs and they'd flood the tube. So literally you're holding your breath trapped in this tube full of water. They'd open the front of the tube and we'd swim out and swim to the surface, training the dogs to deploy out of torpedo tubes. Lots of crazy stuff like that. So one of the things I wanted to do was learn to hunt snipers. Uh, I had gotten into long range shooting and I thought long range shooting was cool, but I'm like, well, if I'm being hunted, I wanna know what's hunting me. So the best way to learn to do that is to learn how to hunt. And so I would sign up for all the sniper competitions as they're out for, they're opposing forces to bad guys. And I'd go out and I'd hunt these sniper teams. And the way we would find these sniper teams is we'd find a slightly elevated platform, you know, a little hill or something like that. And I'd sit there and I'd glass with my binoculars and I'd look, never found anybody that way by myself, but what I'd be doing to be waiting for them. And they'd just be sitting there chilling out and relaxing, kind of like he's doing right now. And then all of a sudden they go, and they'd look, and I'd go, all right, we got something. And I'd start glassing, and I'd check, and I'd glass, check, and I'd glass. And sure enough, there it was, that little bush move in, or some of the guys that weren't quite as professional would have the barrel sticking up on their backpack while they're walking through the woods. I'm like, there's, there's a pointy little stick that's not crooked like most sticks are. And, uh, and we figured out where they were, and I'd follow them until they hit a landmark, a tree, a rock, something I could go to from where I was. And as soon as I had a landmark, I'd go to that landmark, we'd draw the long line, we'd clip the dog in, and we'd track them down. 
What they were using in that situation to tell where the people were was higher frequency noises. So what military guys and especially snipers and people who are trying to be really quiet in the woods but have to carry some gear with them, what they do is they tape down anything that makes noise, anything that clacks or squeaks. They wrap it typically with electrical tape and they get it where it's quiet, but it's quiet to what they're hearing. So as they're walking, if they hear their buddy squeak, they're like, hang on, let me tape you up here and fix you up. What they don't hear, because they don't even know what's going on, is the frequencies they can hear. And so they thought they were being quiet in the woods, but they were hearing that, what's that weird squeaky noise that's over there? That's totally unnatural. And they would indicate on it, and I was able to use their capability of sensing that to find these guys and to go track them down. And so they have that sense of hearing that can draw on a lot of things that uh, we can't pick up any other way. And then the last one is their sight. Now they don't see tremendously better than we do, but they're predators, their eyes are on the front of their heads, not the side like a prey animal. And so they have a very highly focused center in what they see, and they're very attuned to movements. So if you've ever seen a dog looking at a squirrel, you know what they're seeing? Getting a little tail twitch. And they're like, oh, I'm gonna keep that thing. Right? And so when they see movement, they're able to indicate on it for you. And a lot of times it's things that we wouldn't have noticed. And one of my favorite things to do was to go on hikes with my dogs. I would see more wildlife hiking with my dogs, especially if you're on a trail where you were fairly quiet while you were walking, you know, trying to break brush and stomp through twigs and step over a deadfall and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I'd just be walking along with my dog and all of a sudden they'd just pause. And I'd be like, Ooh, what do you see? Oh, wow, look, there's an elk and a baby. That's awesome. And we carry on and then, oh, look at that. That's a coyote. That's pretty cool. And the coyote would kind of be looking at us and be looking at the coyote and would be like, okay, you guys make me uncomfortable and it would run off through the woods. And so their sense of, of seeing was they were picking up movements that I wouldn't have picked up otherwise, and they were telling me there's something there by their indications. So we can use their scent, their hearing, and their sight to our advantage to be able to detect, is there something out there I need to pay attention to? Now most of the things they're gonna tell you about on your property is, there's a raccoon. And it's like, all right, I go out and I check, and hey, there's a raccoon in the trash. Get out of here, raccoon, you don't belong here. But when it is a predator, when it is a bad guy, when it's somebody that's there, they are able to tell me even better than the cameras that I might have set up or the motion sensors or anything else. Because motion sensors are set up where? Avenues of approach, right? Driveways and fences and things like that. Well, if I'm a bad guy and I'm coming on your property, if I have any brains at all, I'm not coming up the driveway, right? I'm gonna try and come in the backwoods or whatever. And it's really, really difficult to set up motion sensors 360 degrees overlapping all the way around your property at a distance that's far enough away that you can do something about it by the time they indicate that something's going on, right? But that guy is a motion detector, a hearing detector, and a scent detector, 360 degrees and 24 seven. So we can use their senses. The other one is a deterrent. Now, not all criminals are smart, but a lot of them are. And if they're smart, they're gonna check out an area before they go in there and try and do something. They're either gonna watch you for your patterns and routines, and maybe they wanna go in if they're trying to rob you or steal stuff from you. They're gonna to wanna to go in when hopefully nobody's home, or maybe only one or two people are at home and they feel like they would have an advantage in that situation, right? So if they are checking out that area and they see, hey, they have trained dogs. What do the neighbors have? Maybe the neighbors don't have any trained dogs. We wanna go over there and look at those guys, right? So having a deterrent is not a guarantee, but it can definitely be helpful. If you're moving in public with your dog and somebody's looking for a victim, they're much more likely to go, uh, train dog? No, I'm gonna find somebody else. I'm not gonna go mess with that person. Now here's the deal. If they do look at you, whether it's at your home and there's a, obviously a trained dog, whether it's moving in public and there's obviously a trained dog, and they decide, yeah, you're the person that I wanna attack still, that's, that criminal is a much, much higher risk profile for you than somebody who would just move on to the next person. We're gonna talk about that a little bit later when we get into the things that, why we train our dogs the way we do, and things that you should be asking about when, when you're looking at who to get a dog from and the different kinds of training that they do. Now, if you have to use your dog, or if you actually end up in a situation where you're actually in a confrontation, they are a distraction and they cause damage. So the distraction is this, if you have multiple people Right, so one on one, I can focus on that one person, I can deal with that one person if I have to deploy my dog or if I have to draw a weapon, I have one person to focus on. If you have multiple people, your situation has just compounded itself significantly. 
right? So my little three gangbanger dudes that were out there, if I'd had to get out and deal with that situation and they actually didn't want to try and do something even with me in the dog's presence, then having the dog with the ability to move from person to person, causing damage every time it does, but also being a distraction because as soon as that dog hits that first person and they're like, oh crap, this dog actually does bite and it, it's hitting the first person and then moving to the second person, whereas 100% of their attention just gone. Right into the center of themselves, focused on that thing right there, right? Which allows me to do things where I don't have a, they're not directly confronting me. So if they have guns and they're thinking about shooting, they're now shooting amongst themselves, trying to hit the dog. Now they might hit the dog, but if they're doing that, they're focused there, and now I'm not running for cover and shooting, I can actually stop and stand and take more aimed fire because in a gunfight, in a normal gunfight where two people are just shooting at each other, the average number of rounds hit is one in five. So for every five rounds you fire, you might hit your target once because you're running, you're ducking, you're moving because you're not, you're not shooting at a paper target in that situation, right? It's shooting back usually. You're both moving. Well, if the person is being engaged by this, and they're fully engaged in that in terms of all their attention has gone there. I'm not running right now. I don't need to run the cover. I can focus on dealing with that threat. And if that threat is shooting, well now I'm justified in using deadly force as well, right? And they're also causing damage each time. So every time they hit a forearm and thrash, like you'll see him do when he hits, that, that thrashing is ripping through that muscle in that forearm. A couple of those hits and your ability to hold weapons has gone down significantly because this is the threat on a human. Right here, if I take this away from you, your ability to cause me damage goes way, way down. It's not zero. If you're a Muay Thai kickboxer, you can still do some stuff with your knees and your feet, right? But if you can't hold a weapon, if you can't grab me and choke me, if you can't clinch me, your ability to hurt me has gone down significantly, right? So they're causing that damage and they're being that distraction. And then the last one is companion and adding courage. Now this sounds like a little bit of frou-frou stuff to some of us guys, right? We're like, no way, man, I'm gonna go out and check out when I hear that noise in the middle of the night. But most people who are getting dogs, a lot of the guys are getting them because they're going, I travel, I'm not always home. I want a dog at home with my family when I'm not there, and so what's gonna happen there? Well, if your wife is at home by herself and there's a noise, Let's say there's a camera and she sees something on it. Let's say you've got a motion detector or there's just, hey, there's obviously something out there that needs to be checked and it's dark. I don't wanna go out there and check it. What are my options? Well, if you have a dog in the room with you and you have your pistol, your shotgun, whatever it is, you know, anybody comes through that bedroom door, they're gonna have a really bad night. But I don't wanna just ignore that thing that's out there, but I ain't going out and checking it out myself either. So I can call the cops and wait 45 minutes or an hour for them to respond to me if I'm in a rural area. And I'm not too worried about it because if somebody comes in this house, I got it covered. But I don't necessarily need to go out there and check it out either. But there's a big difference between that when you've got that companionship and you know it's gonna be me and my buddy dog against whoever comes through that door versus I'm there all by my freaking self and I'm waiting for somebody to come out here and help me. And I don't know if this dude's gonna try and come in a window or a door or whatever the case may be. Right, that peace of mind and that calm and that courage and the fact that I've got something with me that's gonna help me fight is a huge addition to a security plan, especially when it's one person there by themselves and there's not that teamwork that you guys can do when you're both home. So, who here is familiar with an escalation of force? Okay, so if you've been military law enforcement, you've probably heard of an escalation of force. What this means is, if a bad guy or anybody, right, let's say you get in a confrontation with somebody and let's say they start yelling at you, okay? Well, if you're defending yourself and if this is a situation where it's appropriate to yell back, you could yell back and if they push you, you can push back. But if they yell at you and even if they walk up and push you, now there's a few, very few exceptions to this, you can't just draw your gun and shoot them, right? That, because that level of force was way too high for the level of force they were using, right? And so if you end up in the fight after the fight, that's what I call the legal fight when other people are deciding later on when everything's over, are you gonna go to jail or not over this? You wanna be able to articulate, it was very reasonable what I did. And if, it was, if they agree with you that it was reasonable, you get to go home and spend the rest of your life enjoying your life, right? And so law enforcement are held to the same standard, but they have a bat belt. And their bat belt lets them deal with all these various escalations of force. Oh. You're gonna push me, I'm gonna draw my baton. Oh, you're not gonna comply, I'm gonna pepper spray you. 
right? They have these little things that they can add in there that you guys don't carry batons. You guys don't carry pepper spray. If you do, hey, more power to you. But I don't know anybody who routinely carries a whole kit on their body and just walks around their normal life that way, right? And so what the dog does is it mimics your ability to have an escalation of force as you go. So number one, the presence of the dog is a deterrence. When a law enforcement officer shows up, they say the presence of the uniform is a deterrent, right? Because now somebody showed up that can legally put handcuffs on you and make you sit in a box for a little while. <laughs> and so that is a deterrent, right? Just the presence. But then they also have their bat belt, which is not concealed, it's all out in the open, right? So now they have the potential for a use of force. So if somebody walks up, that officer can draw their taser, they can draw their pepper spray and be like, you better do X, Y, or Z, or it's about to get bad for you right now. You as a person, you have one of these dogs, you can say, stay back or you'll get bit, do you understand? And you can put your dog on watch, but you can hold the lead and they're gonna show aggression at the end of that lead. If that person walks into that dog, they're gonna get bit, but they see before they get there, that dog is serious. I don't know if I want to walk into that. And if they do continue to walk into it and you're giving them verbal warnings, they're going to get bit. But now I've been able to articulate, I warned this person, they were still a threat. They continued to approach me. And when they walked into my dog, they got bit. But what if they draw a weapon? Well, if they draw a weapon, all I have to do is let go of that lead. Now my dog is loose and they can go in and engage with that person. And if the person still wants to fight, now I can draw my firearm, my other weapon, and I can escalate to lethal force should I need to. Now, do you have to do that every time? No, but is it a lot easier to articulate that you took as many reasonable steps as you could to not kill that guy before you had to get to that point? And if you've never killed anybody, anybody who's cool -hoo about, oh yeah, some bad guy does something to me, I'm just gonna shoot him. Yeah, you've never killed anybody. <laughs> anybody who's killed somebody, knows, yeah, I wish that I, uh, if I could go back, it'd be better if I didn't have to have killed that person. You are never the same person ever, ever again in your entire life once you kill somebody. So if that can be avoided, that's your ideal situation. And they work while you sleep, they're hypervigilant, you can take them anywhere in many situations, so there is some limitations to that, but if you have any kind of disability at all, they can become your service dog as well and now you can legally move with them wherever you go and you've got a weapon. I used to fly on airplanes with two protection dogs all the time. And I always joked when I went through security because they're like, do you have any weapons? I'm like, not as far as you're concerned, I don't. Like, I have these two things with me, but they're my service dogs. And I had a military uh, prescription for a service dog, so I was good to go. My dogs never bit anybody that wasn't supposed to be bit, right? <laughs> And, uh, and when you're thinking about dogs and how to add them in, my mentor used to say, one dog is defense, two dogs are an army, three dogs are unstoppable. And yesterday we did two dogs, which is a whole different experience than one. What? It's fun and interesting. Yeah, it's fun and interesting. Once you get a dog, one on each arm, there ain't much you're doing at that point. You're pretty much trapped, right? And if, they, if one is letting go, that's actually bad for you because what that means is they're gonna start hitting all kinds of other areas on your body and start putting the person into panic mode. And uh, I was a little disappointed in Punisher. He wasn't quite as big. Yeah, I was looking for him to fight my I own. know, I was like, Punisher's usually my asshole dog. So when I deploy him with another dog, he usually, as soon as he's like, oh yeah, you got arms, all right, I'm gonna start hitting ankles and feet and everything else. And I had him all prepped up for it. All right, listen, if, if that happens, the dog that's biting, you can feel she's on there. You don't have to worry about that dog too much. You look for the other dog and keep him engaged with your arms. And the Punisher just went and grabbed his arm and they both pinned his arms back. And I was like, all right, well, different training moment. We'll take advantage of this. So he's over there getting chewed on and I'm like, all right, everybody, you see what's happening over here? And we kind of walked through the situation that way a little bit. All right, so when we start developing our dog's protection techniques, there's certain things that we want to do. And these are the questions that you're going to want to ask people about if you're calling around and trying to figure out who you want to work with, if you want to do protection stuff with your dog. And the questions we started asking is, well, what if somebody tries to stab or shoot my dog? And this is a question that's largely ignored in the law enforcement community because most law enforcement dogs, they're not protection dogs. What they are is they're apprehension dogs. Their job is to go and catch a bad guy, usually who's hiding or running. 90% of dogs that are used in law enforcement are because the person is hiding or running. Dogs are faster, they can catch the person, or you get a call something like, armed robbery in progress. All the police officers race to the spot because it's exciting and you don't usually get exciting calls when you're a police officer, it's usually boring stuff. 
and you all get there. Of course, he's not still in the store when you get there. He just ran out like two minutes ago, right? But well, he ran out and he went that way. So we all court on the area so that we hopefully he can't run across the road and anything like that. So you got officers all along all these street intersections and they're looking for anybody trying to run across the road. And then they bring out canine. Now, what usually happens is this guy realizes, holy crap, I'm surrounded, and he kind of hunkers down. And then the canine goes out there and finds him, hopefully. Or you get a call, there's an alarm on a warehouse or something like that. Somebody went into the warehouse, and as soon as they see red and blue lights flashing outside, they're like, ooh, better hide, and the dog's going in. Now, if that person wanted to fight, he wouldn't be hiding, right? If the guy who's running away from the cops because he thinks he's got a warrant or he's got drugs on him or whatever, if he was running, if he wanted to fight, he wouldn't be running. Right, so they're using dogs on people who generally don't want to fight. Now, occasionally they will turn and fight, but nine times out of 10, they're not looking for the fight, they're looking to run away. Now, remember when we talked earlier about if somebody sees you with one of these dogs on your property, or you moving in public with one of these dogs, and they decide, yeah, that's the person I want to attack. That level of threat is way, way higher. And so in those situations, there's gonna be a fight. And that fight is often gonna entail, if the dog comes in and starts to bite, if you are that guy, that bad guy, and you had a knife and a dog starts biting you, what are you probably gonna try and do? I'm gonna draw my knife and start trying to stab this dog off, me, right? Well, if that dog does bite and hold, which is the predominant training method in the industry, that dog is stationary. Now that, that's gonna be some injury right there, that spot that he hit. But now I've got, a, a, I've got an animal that I have trapped. It's trapped right there on my arm. And I can, and if I know how to use a knife, I'm gonna stab and cavitate. Most people don't know how to use knives. So they just stab over and over and over again, right? But either way, you're doing a lot of damage to that animal. So what we train our dogs to do is if they're about to be struck, they jump off and they retarget. They jump off and they retarget. And so it doesn't matter to me whether there's a weapon in their hand or not, but certainly if there's a weapon in their hand, they need to be avoiding that weapon and hitting the arm that has the weapon in it so that they damage that forearm so they can't use these things like we talked about and hold that weapon to hurt me or the dog. So I highly encourage, find somebody who will train the dogs to retarget, and we call it bite and fight, right? Retarget and counterattack. The other thing that we ask ourselves is, well, okay, so what if somebody's shooting at the dog while they deploy? This is one of the like criticisms we get. Oh yeah, well you deploy your dog and bad guy, they're just gonna shoot them. And I'm like, well, that certainly could happen. I mean, if somebody has a gun and they start shooting, you or your dog can get hit. And there's a rule of thumb that goes in fights. If there's a gun fight, people are getting shot. If there's a knife fight, people are getting cut or stabbed. And if there's a fist fight, people are getting punched. There's no fight where you walk away, yeah, that was pretty cool. No injuries on me, look at that. I took that bad guy down, I'm awesome. The only way that happens is if you really are awesome and that person was truly pathetic, and they didn't have any business doing anything anyway, right? And you were probably just in a bar fight and drunk if that's what happened. So in a real situation, that can happen. Remember we talked about one in four shots, or, or one in five shots are typically what's hit in a gunfight? That's because people are moving, right? Look at us, we're big and we're slow. Even if you're fast for a person, you're slow compared to them, right? And so, and they're a half or a quarter our size. They're really hard to shoot. The only time it's easy to shoot a dog is on a chain, ask the ATF. They do it all the time. But when a dog's not on a chain, they're really hard to hit. So, and, and when they start seeing things, they start flanking to the side. Now, what is going on if I deploy my dog on a bad guy because he drew a weapon, right? Because you're not gonna deploy your dog on somebody if they haven't already presented a weapon. But somebody presents a weapon and then you are in that situation where, oh, I need to let go of the sleep and my dog needs to go, right? If they've got a gun and they're shooting at my dog, what are they not shooting at? Yeah. Me, right? So I can draw my, my pistol, typically, because you're not usually gonna have a concealed AR-15 that you're gonna pull out of your pants, and I can put rounds on that person, which are hopefully much more effective than if I was having to run for cover, right? And I can end that threat. Now, hopefully my dog didn't get hit, but if they did, remember, gunfights, people get shot, Knife fights, people get cut, and fist fights, people get hit. You deal with the damage after. You don't sit there and worry about the damage in the middle of the fight, okay? My pet peeves are movies and TV shows where somebody gets shot and everybody goes, oh no, we have to take care of them right now. That's not what happens in a fight. 
somebody gets shot and basically in the back of your mind you're like well see you in a little bit like i'll come back hopefully you didn't die and i'll patch you up or you can patch yourself up because the key is you in that threat that's what happens in a fight you end the threat you don't worry about who's dropping to your left and right or in front of you or anything else you end the threat so you stay focused on the threat and then afterwards you go hey is everybody okay oh look poochie got shot in the leg well looks like we're going to the vet and we go to the vet and we let everybody get patched up by the people who do patching up stuff after the fact, right? And so they're half our size and twice as fast. They're really hard to hit, but there's no guarantees that this kind of stuff isn't going to happen because real fights are real. What if I have multiple attackers? Okay, what if I have a situation where there's multiple attackers and I've got to deal with that? You want your dog trained to not be so hyper-focused on one person that if there's multiple things going on, they can't be called off and re-engaged into other attackers. So one of the things we do with a lot of our dogs is we call them manning drills. So we have reverse drills on arms and we have manning drills to release off one person and go to another person. And the way we'll run these drills is I'll deploy my dog. And so there's a bad guy over there. I deploy my dog and the bad guy and he's over there fighting the bad guy. And then there's a dude hiding over here behind a vehicle and he's wearing a bite suit too. And he comes running in and we start tussling with each other. And then I go, let's go, let's go, let's go. And the dog turns around and goes, oh crap, there's somebody attacking my person. He comes running in and hits that guy. I create distance because I don't want to stay in that fight. And this guy over here comes around and attacks me from this side. Me and him tussle. Let's go, let's go. We got an issue over here. He goes, oh crap, somebody's over there attacking him again. And they start learning. And once dogs have gone through this drill, they'll hit and they'll start to fight. And they'll swing themselves around so they keep an eye on their handler over there. And they can see, is anybody coming over and messing with my person while I'm fighting? It's really cool to watch them do that. But you want your dog trained to be able to deal with those threats because there's not always only one threat. In fact, often, especially if it's any kind of coordinated attack, there's multiple people that you gotta deal with. And then, what if I plan to go into the fight with my dog, right? Now there are many, many times you are not gonna go into a fight with your dog. And us guys think, I'm always gonna go into the fight with my dog. Man, I deploy my dog, I'm going in there right alongside of him. Unless you got a three-year-old kid with you. What are you gonna do with your three-year-old kid? I'm getting my three-year-old kid to safety. So me and my kid are getting to safety. Hopefully it's our vehicle if we're in public, right? Somewhere where it's safe. And then I'm gonna call my dog from a distance back to me because I don't wanna go and get any closer to that person than I absolutely have to, right? So you want your dog to be able to be fought alongside with, meaning me and my dog together fighting with a person and they're not targeting me, right? They're not getting confused by that. And also to be able to be recalled from a distance. So I should be able to move away. And that's actually what ended up happening yesterday was they were biting on him. The plan was one was going to be on an arm, the other one was going to be biting him, and I was going to go put him on the ground. And when they both went arms, I went, all right, well, good opportunity to show we can recall from a distance. So we kind of had a little bit of chitter-chatter back and forth while the fight was going on. And then I stood back and I said, stop fighting my dog and I'll call him off. Out, let's go. They both came running right back up to me. And then I could control what do I want him to do from this point, right? You want to be non-compliant? All right, we'll send the dogs back in or you can get on the ground, you can put your hands up to the side, I'm gonna call the police, and we're gonna get this whole situation figured out, right? But when you have these things present, your ability to deal with those situations and have more options, because that's what you want in a fight, right? Everybody thinks, oh, this is how a fight's gonna go down. Well, there's one thing I can guarantee you, it ain't gonna go down that way. Whatever the, that thing in your head is that's gonna happen when somebody shows up at your house to do a home invasion, or somebody shows up in a parking lot to try and kidnap you, or whatever in your mind the scenario is that you need to defend yourself from, I can promise you one thing. It won't happen the way you think it's gonna happen. It never does. And it's gonna be different every single time. So don't get yourself locked into, oh, if this, then I'll just do that, and yay, the whole world's fine now. That's not how fights work. You want options, and you want the ability to adjust and react quickly to various different situations. All right, so we've kind of gone through, we talked about the three ways that you can go about getting a protection dog, getting a puppy from somebody who is a breeder slash trainer, and working with that person to bring the dog up to the level of protection you want. Paying somebody to do the work for you, and then providing that support for you as you go so that you've got a protection dog ready and you don't have to invest a huge amount of time into it. And then I already have a dog. If your dog has a good temperament for protection, finding somebody who will work with you and your dog to bring that protection out in the dog so that now you've got a protection dog in your area. And we can help with all three of those, but I encourage you to call and talk to other people before you go investing a lot of money in any of this. You shouldn't just go, oh yeah, one guy, I'm totally going with that guy. Talk to other people, but ask some questions. Do you do bite and hold? 
Yeah, well, why? How do you deal with somebody trying to stab your dog? How do you deal with somebody doing this? How do you deal with somebody doing that? Stabbing is the greatest risk to them in a bite and hold situation. That is their number one risk. And if they don't have a, a solid answer for how they deal with stabs, then maybe you don't want to go with them. That's just something to think about. The dog has access to a world we don't, and we can use its capabilities and its senses to increase our security all the way around. Dogs allow you to have an escalation of force that you don't have unless you're going to carry a bat belt, and I don't see very many people doing that, right, other than Rick. Rick's the one exception. When I met him out here, I was like, dude, you carry a lot of crap with you. And I thought, oh yeah, he's a prepper cat. He's probably just carrying that around because he's here. And then he came to pick up one of the dogs he bought from me. He shows up, and he's dressed the same way. I'm like, is this what you always wear? He's like, every single day, this is what I wear. I'm like, you're a unique person. <laughs> and, uh, thumbs up, kudos to you, man. But I ain't doing that. I'm not wearing that every day, right? And uh, it's just too much stuff. I got too many things I'm doing. I'm working around doing things. I don't want all that stuff on me all the time. And most people don't. Now, if you do, kudos, right? Good job. But that's not the vast majority of our lives. And then, make sure whoever you're asked, uh, when you talk to them, Whatever your idea of what a good protection system looks like, make sure you're on board with them with that, right? You don't have to do it the way I do it, but we do the way that we do because we think that's the best way. There's other people who have different opinions, and if you agree with their opinions, go get a dog from them. So, okay, at this point, are there any questions? Anything, any questions come? Yeah. Can you justify to use uh, deadly force if you're like, aiming at your dog? So if someone presents a weapon in public, now you need to know your state laws, but in most states that have fairly good uh, freedoms and, and firearms laws, if someone has drawn a weapon, they have presented a threat that usually authorizes you to use deadly force. Now, if nothing's going on and you let your dog run and bite somebody and they're defending themselves when nothing happened, you're probably the one in, in trouble at that point, right? Which is why we spend so much time doing stability with our dogs. You've seen our dogs move around. And if you have come to our tent at any time that we've been here, you can come in and pet all three of our dogs. They're like, hey, this is great, yeah. And then I can flip that switch on and put them into a protection situation, right? So that's another thing is make sure that the people that are training your dog stabilize your dog, which basically means if I say it's okay, leave it alone, it's okay, leave it alone. But if they were the aggressor and then they drew a weapon, it doesn't matter what they're pointing that weapon at. They aggressed, they drew a weapon, I defended myself. And although, it, who's a member of US Law Shield? If you guys didn't go talk to those guys, I highly, highly recommend you join something like US Law Shield. If you use a dog to defend yourself, they will represent you in the fight after the fight in your, your court fight. That is likely to happen if you defend yourself anyway. If you have to defend yourself for any reason, there's a good chance you're gonna end up in court with them saying, little Johnny was just a good boy and never meant to hurt anybody. And he was so mean and he shot him and we want a million dollars for it. And so that is a very real possibility and you need to have some kind of insurance to cover you in that. It's 120 bucks a year. I don't get anything from them. I just like their organization and we're a member of it. So I do recommend you have something like that. Any other questions? Yeah. What, um, what do you do is kind of just for the sake of the dog and you and everything, your family and everything else, what do you do long term uh, as far as your vision for food in the event yep. that the dog food is not available? You make your so own preparations kind of things, right? Yep. So what we do, number one, kibble in a somewhat climate controlled environment will last a long time. You need to keep it dry, you need to keep rats away from it. So we have cats and we have a spot where we keep it. Now, my spot is a semi, it's our kennel, right? So it's like a garage environment. So it wouldn't last you know, a year in that environment, but if you have an air conditioned house and you store it in a sealed container, you, that'll last you a year, year and a half easy. So you can have a year's supply of food for your dog and you cycle it like you would anything else and you're feeding them the old stuff. You open it and it's moldy, throw it away. Don't feed moldy food to your dogs. The other thing that we do is we freeze dry various different raw stuff that we get. So when we go to the store, a lot of times the local uh, grocery stores to us will have 10 pound bags of chicken for like $2.50. And I'm like, buy it all. And my wife will go in with a shopping cart and dump it all in the shopping cart and then we put it in our freezer. And then when I get enough, I run it through an industrial meat grinder, 
We mix it with organs that we get from various different places, mix it all together, it's a big nasty gooey mess. And uh, we put it in our freeze dryer and freeze dry it, and then that stays on our shelf stored. Uh, and then if you have any kind of small livestock, chickens, rabbits, anything like that, and you can ramp your production of that up, they do basically one rabbit a day per dog, uh, um, half a chicken a day per dog, things like that. And, um, and those are ways that you can keep them going too. So yeah, I like to have the like kibble storage and then the other stuff I add in as much as I can. And, um, and then if you have enough egg production, you can also do eggs and supplement food that way. <laughs> It's kind of whatever. So when you're doing raw with a dog, what you want is as much of the gut as you can. So the, the hardest part to get, it's almost impossible, is the actual intestines. Um, but organs, so a buddy of mine goes hunting up in Georgia and he has a, like a local processor up there that does their deer for him. And he usually has bunches of lungs, hearts, livers that they don't want them. People don't want those parts of their animals. And I tell them, when you go up and get your deer processed, I want it all. However much he'll give you, bring me all of that stuff back. And then we run the livers and the lungs and the hearts through the, the grinder as well and mix it all together. So the biggest thing is that you're getting a good mix of animal byproducts. You want bone, raw bone. Raw bones are safe for dogs, cooked bones are not. So you want bone, you want meat, and then you want organs as much as you can get in there. And, uh, and that's usually a good thing. But if you're in a situation like that, it's like whatever I can give them, I can give them. Right, any leftovers that I have, we ain't throwing any food away. All the, the stuff that if we're not gonna eat it, it goes to the dogs to supplement that feed as we're going as well. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, I got one. You yes. guys use uh, e-collars? Like how, what's your sort of style of training these dogs? So we practice? personally use prongs exclusively. There are situations where we've encouraged the use of an e-collar for specific situations. Like every once in a while, I have a real small little female and she has this like 85 pound stocky dog and she goes to correct it and he's like, yeah, whatever, I ain't gonna do it anyway. And so she's just not strong enough and the dog won't respect her because she doesn't have the strength. So we will use an e-collar and put that on and she goes, bow, and he goes, okay, I respect you. Right? Whereas if, the, if you can't produce enough force with the, the prong collar, then sometimes they won't respect. But, um, but that doesn't happen very often. Once the dog's been trained on the prong, it, it's mostly just communication anyway. But um, the, uh, so there's a few situations where we use it, but 99% of the time it's prong collar is how we go. And, uh, and the other thing is if you really know how to use an e-collar, you can do some good stuff with an e-collar. But an e-collar requires way more finesse to handle the dog properly, especially to teach them new things with it than a prong collar. You can mess up a lot of stuff with a prong collar and, and fix it pretty quick if you messed it up. You mess up with an e-collar and that dog's like schizophrenic, where the heck's the shot coming from this time if you do it wrong and if you overdo it and things like that, you can really mess a dog up with an e-collar. So they're not the worst thing in the world or anything like that and guys that really know how to use it, I'm like, dude, that's like, I love, it's like a art watching them run an e-collar uh, remote. But if you don't know how to do it, it's easy to mess it up and it's something that you basically gotta spend some time actually developing the technique for. Yes. So every breed was created for a reason, right? And a lot of times people go, oh, that's a cool looking dog. I want one. Now can I turn it into X? And it's like, that's not how you select a dog breed or a dog that you're going to get. You go, what do I want to do with this dog? Right? I could train him to be a water retrieving dog if I really wanted to. But if I want a water retrieving dog, I should probably go get a Labrador, a Golden Retriever, a Poodle, if I can find a working line Poodle, a dog that was bred to be a water retrieving dog, right? If I want a dog to go catch pigs, I could probably train six or eight Malinois to go chase pigs and catch pigs, but that's not really what they were designed for. What I should really probably go do is get some black mouth curs and pit bulls, because that's what they were bred to do, and then run those dogs on pigs and I can go hunt pigs. So when I look, the, the shepherd breed, specifically these three, the German Shepherd, Malinois, and Dutch Shepherd, have been bred for over 200 years at this point for this work. This is what the Germans were creating when they were working on the German Shepherd breed. The, the shepherds, so there's a difference between a shepherd breed and a herding breed. And sometimes people call these herders. They're not herders. They're shepherd's dogs. So a herder, like a border collie or a blue healer or something like that, 
are, are they're bred for go and get those animals and move them here or, or move them and they'll train them on whistles and hand movements and things like that. But their purpose is to go away from their shepherd and then move the animals in a certain way for the shepherd. The shepherd's dogs stayed with the shepherds and moved with them. But they were also with the shepherd if there was a predator. They were with the shepherd, so they worked alongside the person and they did that. And so they realized when they started getting into warfare with dogs and all this other kind of stuff, hey, that is a really good match if we're going to be dealing with human predators because you pit that dog against a pit bull, guess who's winning? The pit bull. Because the pit bull is an anti-animal animal. I refer to these guys as anti-human animals, right? They're anti-personnel animals. And so their, their whole breeding and, and everything they've done for the last 150, 200 years has been for this kind of work. And so for this kind of work, they're like the ideal breeds for that. There's a few others that they have that are more obscure and they're usually like over in Europe and Russia and stuff like that. But what's readily available here in the US is these three. And then the breeding program that we've been running is based off what the Germans were still working on in the 40s, when of course they started World War II and then lost. And uh, which was they were using the Dutch Shepherd, the Malinois, and what they had as the German Shepherd that had been developed at that point. And they were crossing the Malleys and the Dutch Shepherds into the German Shepherd to continue developing the German Shepherd. As far as they were concerned, they weren't done with the German Shepherd when we fought World War II. They were still developing the breed. And so, as the story goes, Gunther, the battalion commander of the Nazi SS K9 battalion, got his core breeding program and fled to Canada. And then the guy I learned under, trained under him for 17 years. And he was like, this is how we're breeding. This is what we were trying to still do in Germany. This is what we're continuing now. And I just happened to, by chance, fall into the, um, the situation where I got to work with those guys and continue that process. Any other questions? Okay, you guys ready to see some bite work? All right, let's see what this little guy can do. Watch your knee. He's not going to bite you in it. He's just going to crash into it as okay. fast as he can. I have one question. Yes. Is there still like kind of, so when they're, they're a working dog, mm -hmm. they're not trained, uh, they don't respond to like affection the same way that. Oh, these guys love affection. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I pet on these guys all the time. Uh, so I tell my clients when they get their dogs, I'm like, you pet your dog as much as you want, but you decide when you're petting them. They don't decide when they get pet. So th that's the discipline part of it. Mm -hmm. Is if I told you to lay there, you lay there. But if I put one of these dogs up on the couch beside me and I start petting them, they just, I love you, man. You're the best person in the whole world. Yeah, they love affection from their people. And, um, and so there's no problems with affection. They, my kids snuggle with these dogs all the time. And um, so the, the key in, in discipline, discipline doesn't always mean being mean. And work doesn't always mean, oh, we're doing bite work or we're tracking. Work is that right there. Right now, he's working. They've been working all weekend. What have they been doing? Laying behind our booth, looking cute, and getting petted on when people come over. Right? It's doing what I say, when I say, how I say it, so that you function in our life. And so that's what work is. Because if you get a protection dog, you might, maybe, once in that dog's life, use that dog for protection work. But you know what you're going to do every day? You're going to live with that dog in your house. Right? And so that dog needs to stay in its place, not get into your trash, not eat your couch, not mess with your kids, right? It needs to be a good dog. And so that's what our dogs are trained to do is live in your home with you. We don't play fetch and all this other kind of stuff with our dogs. I tell people, if you want to do that, you can train the dog to do that when you get home, but that has no practical application to your life. I train the dogs for practical <coughs> application, living in your life, moving in public, and protection. Those are the things that we focus on and they integrate very well into families and even with other dogs and stuff like that, we've integrated dogs into numerous different various situations and families where there's other dogs and things like that as well. If you have a dumb dog mm -hmm. already and you introduce a working dog into the family, does the dumb dog become a hindrance to the working dog if they and think that the working dog is like playing or they want to play with the working dog? Like how does a working dog so move alongside the, the main thing, thing what most people end up doing is they put a little bit of obedience into their other dog and, and they just have it basically obedient but as long as you focus on that dog mm -hmm. and that dog is doing what it's told to and you're fair to it in other words if you have little yippy dogs you don't let them run up and bite them in the face yeah. 
Yeah. Right? That's not fair to him, especially if he's being required to lay in a place. Right. If your dog is coming up and constantly pouncing on him and stuff like that, no, 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 no. That's not appropriate behavior. Get away. Leave him alone, right? As long as that basic behavior will happen where they're not over there, you know, hurting him mm -hmm. or being unfair to him in some way or trying to dominate him, mm -hmm. then you're fine. Right? Because if I told him to lay there, he has to lay there. And if he knows he's going to get in trouble if he moves and another dog's all up in his face, all he wants to do is just kind of tuck himself away so he doesn't get in trouble. And he's just like, man, I just want this little dog to leave me alone. But, you know, but this sucks, right? I'm stuck in this corner. So you be fair to them. And usually if it's little dogs, the way we introduce them is we put up a gate. And we put the little dogs on the other side of the gate. And we just let them watch the dog for about a week. And after about a week, the little dog's like, that thing's boring just lays there mm -hmm. and then one at a time we start bringing them in and they kind of run over and sniff it and they're like oh okay you just kind of lay there and then we'll do another one and another one because most of the people have yippy dogs have more than one yippy dog and then the, they integrate in and everything's going great